Um, today we'll be focusing mainly on the agricultural nanotechnology. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker of the day. Um, Dr. Jason White is the director of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, which is the oldest agricultural experiment station in the country. His primary research program focuses on food safety and security with specific interest on the impact of nanomaterials on agricultural plants and on the use of nanoscale materials uh, to increase food production through sustainable nano-enabled agriculture. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. White. Uh, great. Well, so this, this session will be quite a difference from, uh, from this morning I was listening in. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to join you. I was actually on my way to the airport yesterday afternoon, uh, early afternoon, and, and got the text message from Air Canada that my flight was canceled. And there was just no way for me to get there in person for the session after that happened. So apologies for that. I, I do wish I were, were there. Uh, so as noted, we're going to be talking about uh, agriculture and specifically nanotechnology in agriculture. Uh, and I think the best place to start is really to kind of look at what uh, our current perspective is and maybe, maybe a little bit about, about where we've been. Um, there we go. Um, so uh, within the last 50 years, it's known that agricultural productivity has increased dramatically. This was a function of the green revolution uh, that we all know about. Uh, but the fact remains that we still have significant shortcomings uh, in, in how we grow and distribute food on this planet. This was a paper we published in Nature Nanotechnology back in 2018. Uh, it was featured on the cover. And one of the things we showed, for example, is down here on the right, uh, is that the, the year over year productivity for about 11 crops, and you have uh, four shown here, but for 11 crops has actually decreased significantly. Uh, so the orange bars are the periods from 1975 to 1984, and the blue is from 2005 to 2014. So these are still year over year increases, but what you're seeing is the magnitude of those increases is decreasing, which basically means we're becoming less effective at producing food. And that's gonna be an issue as you'll see in a minute. We also know we have significant problems with hunger, uh, 800 million chronically hungry every day on the planet, 2 billion suffering from micronutrient deficiencies or hidden hunger. Uh, we also know that, that there's this measure called yield potential of an agricultural system. Uh, and we never get uh, really above 80%. In many instances, we're well below that. Uh, and then the piece of this pie that we've started working on, uh, initially at least, was agrochemical delivery. You know, when a grower adds uh, pesticides or fertilizers, anywhere from one to 25% makes it to its target and the rest is just lost, which is both wasteful and damaging. But the real driver here is global food security. And this, this is not a new problem. We've known this for 15 or 20 years that to feed the population that we're gonna have by 2050, we're gonna to have to increase food production by 70 to 100% uh, globally. Uh, and remember the data we were just looking at, we're, we're, we're moving in the wrong direction. So we're gonna to have to turn that around in a significant way. And, and it's not gonna be easy to do that. We're gonna have significant negative pressure from a changing climate. Uh, in calendar year 2021 in Connecticut, we actually had the, the uh, average amount of rainfall we were supposed to have, but it came at completely different times of the year. We had the hottest April and May and driest April and May that we'd ever had and the wettest July and August. So it made growing food really difficult. Uh, and then there's unforeseen you know, human factors, if you want to think about it, things like COVID and the war in Ukraine. So many challenges. So a lot of us have really come to the conclusion that we're, we're really gonna to have to revolutionize how we grow and distribute food uh, on this planet in the next couple of decades. Uh, and nanotechnology can and will play a significant role there. Now, this is not a new concept. You can do web of science searches and you can find review articles on nanotechnology and agriculture in 2003, 2004. The idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. How can we apply nanotechnology to produce more food more quickly, to do it using less energy and water and to help us generate, uh, to help us deal with the waste that's generated. Uh, and, and basically you just put the word nano in front of whatever agricultural term you want. Uh, and these are just some papers that have been published out of my group and, and uh, with collaborators and others in, on this topic. Uh, so the research program at the experiment station uh, kind of runs on two tracks. 
it's actually this implications work that is that is uh, where this all started. My PhD is in environmental toxicology. And when I started hearing about engineered nanomaterials in 2005, 2006, you know, I kind of viewed these as the next emerging contaminants, uh, you know, the next DDT or the next PFAS. Uh, so I set up a research program to look at the toxicology of these materials in agricultural systems. And I still have this program. I've got one or two postdocs working on it. But what we noticed after about four or five years in this space was that not only were there certain instances where these materials were not toxic, but they were actually conveying benefit to the plant. Uh, so this second line of research really, really popped up uh, and, and um, really has become the larger, larger part of our program. We've got five postdocs working on this, plus three staff scientists and a couple of Fulbright scholars. Uh, so I'll go through some of these areas uh, today over the next 20 minutes or so. I'm not going to be able to show you all of them, but it's really become, you know, a major, major thrust of our work here. Um, a lot of it's funded by the United States Department of Agriculture, but I'm part of two centers that's funding some of this work. Uh, but really the most important part of this is are, are these red bars. As I said, I'm trained as an environmental toxicologist. So our perspective on all of this is if we can't come up with an application that's both safe and sustainable, then, then we shouldn't be looking at that application. Uh, so these, these programs, you know, they run in parallel, but they're really um, you know, more interactive than not. Uh, so uh, it was about 2014 where we first moved into this space. Uh, we decided to work on soil-borne diseases. My training, as I said, is environmental toxicology, but we have a lot of plant pathologists here. Uh, and soil-borne diseases, you know, pick your crop and you're going to lose 20% of it to, to a soil-borne um, uh, fungus or nematode. Uh, specifically with fungi in the U.S., we know we're spending $600 million a year on fungicides and we're still losing $200 million worth of crops. Uh, in the bad old days, we just used to just, uh, lay plastic down on the field and fumigate the soil and just kill everything, but, but thankfully we don't do that anymore. Um, so we know that many micronutrients, things like copper, manganese, we could list 10 or 11, 11 of them, they're an important part of plant defense systems. You can think about it in terms of plant immunity. We were hearing about human immunity this morning. This is plant immunity. And we know that um, it, it can be difficult to get these nutrients to plants, particularly if that plant is stressed when it needs more of them. Uh, you add them to soil and they become unavailable for soil chemistry reasons. You add them to the to the shoot system and the plant really can't accumulate a lot of them and send them to the roots, which is where you're gonna need them for a, a soil borne uh, disease. So we asked the simple question, what about if, if we started adding these nutrients in nanoscale form, would we see differences? Would they be more effective at enhancing nutrition and suppressing disease, stimulating immunity? And we like to target, we like to note that we're not targeting the pathogen directly. There are groups that are doing this. You can do this with silver and copper and some of these other elements where at specific doses, you can take out the pathogen itself. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to actually stimulate plant immunity. Uh, and you'll see that this works pretty well. Uh, so our first paper we actually published in 2016, it was after two years of greenhouse and field trials with eggplant and tomato. Those were just two uh, disease systems we had that were working well. Um, our approach is very simple. Uh, we do a single foliar application of these, of these nutrients uh, in oxide form with, you know, comparing to the, the conventional forms. Uh, it's a foliar application. So even when we're using 100 ppm, we're actually only transferring one to two milliliters. Uh, so the, the total milligrams is really quite low. So over here on the right, this is the field data for eggplant. The green is copper, which we'll just focus on. Uh, and so this, the, the center bar is the nanoscale version of the copper. And what you see is you get increased numbers of fruit per plot. This is a measure of disease. You get significant reductions of disease and you get significantly more copper in the root system. And even when you do the in vitro assay, this amount of copper is not, not toxic to this pathogen. Uh, so this, this seems to be a really good approach uh, and it's, it's nanoscale specific. You don't see the benefits with the other form. Uh, and you know, this is actually what got us our first USDA grant because it was field data. Um, you know, we calculated that we spent $44 per acre on our copper. Uh, and, and what did we really do? We just supplied a nutrient that the plant needs and just can't get enough of. So we just supplied it in a unique form. And that $44 investment per acre, because it's a foliar application to seedlings, uh, we're getting a $10,000 return on investment. 
So at that point, I joined an NSF center called the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology. These centers are very large. This is 10 years, uh, $40 million center. And in 2018, they were in year three and they, they made the decision that they wanted to start moving into this, into this space. So I was added to the center. It's, it's a small part of that center, but it's, it's an active area. Uh, so it's a chemistry center. So the focus here is on how we can manipulate and control the chemistry of our material to impact our biological system or to impact reactions at this leaf biointerface. So we published this uh, paper in 2018. And what we did was we took our commercial copper oxide nanoparticles that we were just looking at, and we compared them to a custom synthesized material where we changed the morphology, we made these sheets, and we changed the composition. And what you see is by doing that, you change how it physically behaves and how it biologically behaves. So this is watermelon in field uh, and greenhouse studies. Uh, so here's your measure of disease. Uh, we measured a range of concentrations for both types of copper. Here's your control, disease is very high. The yellow bars are the, the commercial copper oxide. And as noted previously, you gotta get up to a couple of hundred PPM, still only one to two milliliters of that, but you gotta get up to a couple of hundred PPM to suppress the disease or increase your biomass. But what you see is with our custom copper oxide, copper phosphate nanosheets, um, you know, at concentrations as low as <clears throat> 10 milligrams per liter, we're suppressing disease and increasing yield. <clears throat> So the important part here is by controlling and tuning the chemistry, we can optimize the, the impact, the benefit, which if you're talking about sustainability, is, is a pretty good way to go. So this is the paper <clears throat> that was published at the end of 2020, where we really got a, uh, did a deep dive into the mechanism. We switched to soybean and a fungal disease called uh, SDS, sudden uh, death syndrome. Uh, in an art, and this was also published in Nature Nanotechnology on the cover. Uh, and this uh, fungal pathogen in our greenhouse study reduced biomass and photosynthesis by 60 to 70%, created all sorts of problems with antioxidants and fatty acid profiles. But our foliar applications to this system also alleviated much of that damage. But here's, here's where we really got into the mechanism. We looked at the gene expression of over two dozen defense and health related genes. Uh, and we looked at it in the roots. So this is a foliar application, but we're looking at the impact in the root system. And <clears throat> we really isolated this nanoscale copper specific, um, you know, in heat innate disease response stimulation. Uh, and importantly, we were able to relate that to the specific properties of our different types of copper. And we were able to model that computationally because we have some computational chemists in the center. So this was a really important study for us. Um, some of the other elements or nutrients that we're looking at in the center, one is silicon. Silicon is interesting because it's actually not required, but if you supply it, plants do better. Specifically, we're looking at mesoporous silica that was coated with chitosan. Uh, this is again, back to our watermelon fusarium system. Uh, we did a seed treatment and a foliar application here. Uh, and when you do that, you see increased sil silicon content in your, uh, in your plant, which is good. You get enhanced germination uh, and suppression of disease. But what's interesting is what you actually see is many of these stress-related genes are actually down-regulated, which is the exact opposite we were just seeing with copper, where they're all up-regulated. And this is a function of the different mechanisms. So actually what the nanoscale silica is doing is it's stimulating a change in the deposition of root cell wall material. So you're actually increasing the physical barrier and you're preventing the pathogen from getting in. So therefore everything is less stressed. Uh, so there was a field study uh, associated with this, and this is what happens sometimes. We took this system into the field and it completely fell apart. No, uh, no benefit at all in a disease system. But what's interesting is in the healthy system in the field, we actually got a 70% increase in watermelon yield in, in the fruit production. And think about what we're doing here. This is a one to two milliliter application to a seedling uh, of 500 ppm. And then literally months later, we're getting this, this benefit conveyed to this plant. And again, you can look at it in terms of economics, although I prefer to look at it in terms of food production, but we spent about $19 per acre uh, and got an $8,000 increase in economic return for a grower or uh, a 20,000 pound increase in food production per acre. 
So one of the materials we're working with a lot now is nanoscale sulfur. This is a new, a new USDA grant that we got. This paper was actually just published last month uh, in ACS Nano. Uh, sulfur is an interesting one because 20 or 30 years ago, growers, farmers didn't worry about sulfur. There was enough burning of dirty fossil fuels that we were getting sulfur in acid rain, acid precipitation, uh, and there was enough sulfur in the soil. But with the Clean Air Act and other, other initiatives, um, in the last 10 years, what we're seeing is actually soils that are deficient in sulfur and growers have to add it as a fertilizer. Uh, and they're doing this in bulk form, which conveys a number of problems. So we started looking at this in nanoscale form. So this is actually a soil application of different types of nanoscale sulfur comparing it to the conventional forms. This is a greenhouse study and we really kind of went nuts with the measured endpoints, uh, including all the usual things, but also uh, time dependent gene expression, time dependent metabolomics, some two photons microscopy uh, to really kind of see, see what we can see with nanoscale sulfur. Uh, so the plants were harvested uh, at four, eight, and 16 days. It was a short, shorter study. And what we see is that here you see disease. So the blue is the control healthy, and then the green is the disease. You see about an 87% redu 87 reduction in biomass as a function of this, this disease. But what you see is your nanoscale sulfur is, is cutting that, uh, that presence of disease in half. Uh, now, the other types of sulfur do okay, but they don't do as well as the nanoscale sulfurs. Uh, and as I said, when you add these other forms of sulfur into the soil, you, you create problems with pH and other factors. Uh, we also saw that sulfur uh, in, um, was being accumulated, which was not surprising, but that it was size specific, which suggested different ratio, uh, different uptake pathways. And then we were able to demonstrate that uh, some of our two photon microscopy specifically could see only the nanoscale sulfur. It couldn't see sulfur in dissolved forms or in sulfate. Uh, and then our gene expression and, and metabolomics helped us isolate this bioassimilation pathway. So when you add sulfur in normal form, whether it's bulk or ionic, you stimulate the plant, plant sulfate uh, pathways for uptake and distribution. But when the nanoscale sulfur is added, a different pathway is activated that's specific to elemental sulfur, which was pretty interesting to us. And again, we were able to see this, this time dependence with both the gene expression and the metabolomics. And there's a, there's a really important time sensitive window here. And we've seen this in, in other studies. Um, you know, In terms of the gene expression, as you went from four days to eight days, that's when you see all these defense genes and immunity genes being upregulated. But by the time you get to 16 days, they're, they're dropping again. But the metabolomics, you see those metabolites coming up at 18 days and staying high at 16 days. But if you miss that window in that first two or three weeks, you lose the ability to, to convey these benefits to the plant. So this is, this is a really interesting study for us. Um, we ran a field study in parallel. We actually thought we were gonna publish them together, but the data was so good we split them. This is actually under review, but it was the same treatments. Uh, and, and we basically got the same results, except our endpoints were, were, were much more limited. Uh, and the most important endpoint is obviously yield. Uh, and what we, show, what we also saw was actually when you looked at the tomato fruit that was being produced, some of these nanoscale sulfur forms were actually increasing the nutrient content of the fruit itself, which has got us thinking about biofortification, which is another, another strategy here. But again, here's our, here's our economics. You know, we're spending $33 on sulfur uh, per acre, and we're increasing our yield in the healthy system from about five kilograms per acre to almost 12. Uh, and then the disease systems from one to, to two. So significant increases, and, and there's the economics. You're, you're, you know, you're doubling what you're pulling out for, for a grower. So all of that is biotic stress. Uh, we're also looking at abiotic stress, uh, how nanoscale materials can help there, because obviously one of the things we're gonna have to do as we um, move into the future with climate change and increasing populations is we're gonna have to grow plants under more marginal conditions, grow food under more marginal conditions, and, and drought's gonna be an obvious issue here. So one of the things that we're looking at with, dr uh, with drought systems is nanoscale zinc oxide. And th there are reasons why we're looking at this, and I think we don't really have time to go into it, but this is a 
paper we published in 2019, looking at sorghum in the greenhouse. Uh, and in this case, the D is not disease, the D is drought. But what you see is if you impose drought on sorghum, you see decreases in yield and many nutrients. Uh, but what we have shown is that if you have nanoscale zinc oxide and you add that in the soil in relatively low amounts, one to three uh, ppm, you can actually alleviate much of this damage that you're that you're seeing with the drought. And we're still working on the mechanism, but, but RLS production and RLS quenching is really, really important here. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time um, trying to figure out how we can use zinc uh, in, in this type of system. Uh, salinity is another one. This goes back to the NSF center. Uh, and in this case, we were trying to do a seed treatment with, uh, uh, we took a step back to a, to a system that was non-food related, which was cotton, but it was a seed treatment. Cerium is interesting because it's actually not a nutrient at all, but it is known to be uh, an antioxidant. Uh, so if you supply it to plants, it, it tends to improve plant production and growth under, under stressed conditions. And that's exactly what we saw here. Uh, and this is a seed treatment, which is even better than a foliar application, because again, if you can do a seed treatment, then you're really adding very small amounts of material uh, and, you're, and you're getting this benefit. Uh, and in this case, again, we did some, some gene expression work and we were able to isolate these I, R, RLS pathways and ion homeostasis, basically demonstrating that with the, you, know, you were alleviating all of this RLS induced stress from, from us uh, that was experience from the plant uh, being in saline conditions. So you can't talk about agriculture and sustainability without talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, so we haven't done anything with nitrogen yet, but we have a new grant working on phosphorus. Uh, and the issue here is the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that's added in agriculture globally is just absolutely enormous. And, you know, 90 percent of it never makes it to the target. It's lost. Uh, so it's just a tremendously wasteful approach. And then there's all these back end problems um, when these nutrients uh, end up where they're not supposed to be. So this approach was pretty straightforward. Uh, and, and we pitched this to USDA. We said, let's just take all the phosphorus that plant need, the plant needs, but let's actually put it in a biopolymer. Uh, that is highly biodegradable. Uh, and then, you know, you create these coupons where the phosphorus is embedded, and then the phosphorus isn't actually released until the polymer is degraded uh, by the natural soil microbiome. And this is tunable. You can, you can pick different kinds of polymers and have them degrade at different rates, depending on when your plant needs, needs the phosphorus. Uh, so it's a responsive and tunable platform. We published our first paper at the end of last year, and this is some of that data. This was a 150 day uh, greenhouse study with tomato where we measured a whole ton of endpoints on the plants, essentially just showing that when you add phosphorus in this new form, you get equivalent plants and equivalent fruit. But what you also get, and this is leachability, which was our measure of runoff. Uh, this is the amount of phosphorus that was leaching out of those pots after 150 days of growth with a conventional form of phosphorus, a typical form. And this is the amount that's lost when you put it in biopolymers. So you're reducing it by up to 90%. Uh, and this suggests that maybe you could add far less phosphorus or maybe you don't need to add phosphorus the next growing season. So um, we're actually putting together our second, second paper on this topic. That's really interesting. Uh, the other center that I was working with, and I say was because it was actually ending at the end of August, uh, was a center that was funded by Singapore through Harvard, where I had a faculty appointment. And here we're actually looking at a similar approach where we're trying to generate um, responsive uh, carriers for, for agrochemicals, for, for pesticides and fertilizer. Here we're using electro spray uh, to lay down fibers of, of different kinds of polymers, biopolymers. And this paper, which was also just published in ACS Nano, we're taking this core shell approach uh, where you can use different polymers in the core, different column uh, polymers in the shell, and then you could put your cargo in. In this case, our cargo was nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and, and copper. Uh, but you can, again, based on the recipe of your, of your polymers, you can really control how these are degraded uh, in a natural system. So we made polymers that were both, that were pH sensitive in the core, and enzyme responsive in the shell, thinking that as the pH drops, which is what happens when a plant root grows close to something because the pH around plant roots is very low, the outer polymer will break apart. And then the enzyme we actually used was one that was commonly produced by fungal pathogens and that would break down the core to again, you know, release the cargo at a tunable rate. So most of this paper was actually on the synthesis and characterization, but we did do a little bit of plant work 
uh, with soybean and wheat in the, in the greenhouse. These are just photosynthetic parameters. The most important part of this, this is our nanostructures. Uh, and um, so we added the NPK and phos uh, copper at 25% of the conventional form, which would be the 100% form. So we've reduced the amount of nutrients by 75%, thinking because we we're going to be much more accurate. And when you look at some of these photosynthetic parameters, and this is one where actually lower values are better, what you see is that our 25% loading is actually performing equally to the conventional at 100%, uh, demonstrating a 75% reduction which still works. Uh, and then what we also looked at was actually uh, elemental analysis. And uh, we saw a bioaccumulation, increased bioconcentration of some important nutrients with our strategy. The mechanism of this, we have no idea, but, but we're looking at it again, you know, as a, as a biofortification approach. So we're also looking at photosynthesis. Um, some of these nutrients that we're talking about um, either are directly part of photosynthetic enzymes and electron transport, and some of them are actually semiconductors. So the idea being that if you could enhance this front end of food production, enhance photosynthesis, whether it's electron capture or carbon fixation, you could produce more food more quickly. And again, these are all nutrients, well, with the exception of silver, that you're going to be adding uh, anyway. And silver was our negative control. So this was a paper we published in 2020, where we actually wanted to validate a high throughput system with leaf mesophyll protoplasts so that we could screen materials quickly. Um, and But you'd still be measuring all of these photosynthetic endpoints. So this is quantum yield that you see here. Your black bar is your control. Uh, and what you see is that your iron and your manganese oxide are both increasing uh, the quantum yield. So a measure of the electron flow, essentially. Uh, and this is, this is another measure of, of electron movement through the electron transport chain and the thylakoids. You can also measure ATP production, but what you're seeing is some of these, some of these uh, elements, some of these nutrients are increasing those rates. Uh, and again, silver was our negative control. We, we put that in there because we knew it was going to cause toxicity. This is actually an interesting study. We did a bunch of leaf metabolomics that I'm not going to go into. Uh, but essentially, uh, this was our in vitro system. If the in vitro system doesn't you know, perform the way the in vivo ones does, then the whole thing's useless. So we did our, our full spinach study and basically got the same results. Our iron and manganese are not only increasing photosynthetic output, that's translating to increased plant growth and yield. So we actually took a step back um, and started working with cyanobacteria. This was published in ACS Nano last year. Uh, the idea was we knew um, molybdenum disulfide is actually a semiconductor. We knew that it's also a plant nutrient. So um, we wanted to do an in vitro study with uh, cells that would also engage in nitrogen fixation. Uh, and what is the, the short of the long here is that we saw the same increase in carbon fixation, the same increase in photosynthesis, but importantly, nitrogen fixation was also increased and it was increased just to keep the balance with carbon, the carbon nitrogen balance. So we're actually putting in a proposal in two weeks, uh, looking at agricultural crops, um, specifically uh, trying to look at you know, how we can promote both nitrogen fixation and carbon fixation at the same time in, in some of these species, again, with re really low amounts of, of some of these nutrients. Uh, so what's the technological readiness of all of this? This is all just research at this point, uh, obviously. So we, we ran a workshop at McGill University. Uh, I'm going to be there actually in a couple of weeks, hopefully. My flight's not canceled. Uh, and the premise of the workshop was that, you know, nanotechnology really has some tremendous potential here to, to help us uh, with our food security problems. Uh, what, are the, what are the major barriers that we're going to face to actually deploying this in the field? Uh, so we identified those barriers. Uh, and they're listed here, and you'll notice that two of them actually have nothing to do with science at all, um, regulatory and safety concerns of consumer acceptance. But importantly, we identified ways to overcome these barriers. This paper was published in the first issue of Nature Food. Uh, and uh, the other thing we did, oops, sorry about that. The other thing we did is um, we eval evaluated all the different uh, technologies in terms of their performance and readiness. So this, this was a really interesting paper um, that, a, that a group of us came up with. Uh, so the last one I'll show you is actually just a review, a review article, a meta-analysis that was just published in April of this year. 
uh, and, and we got the cover again of Nature Nanotechnology, which is, which is always exciting. The interesting thing here is most of these authors actually work for the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we had a postdoc, uh, they had a postdoc who did uh, this analysis of 500 papers and 37, almost 37,000 patents in this, in this space of nano-enabled um, uh, agrochemicals, specifically pesticides. Uh, and what the analysis showed was that on average, you get a 31.5% increase in efficacy when you go to a pesticide in a nanoscale form, including almost 19% in field trials. But the other benefits, and this is the EPA, remember, the other benefits were not only were we getting increased efficacy, but we were getting decreased damage to non-target organisms. That was decreased by 43%, uh, including you know, decreases in leaching and decreases in loss prior to target. And the benefit with the with nanoscale forms is you, you can really manipulate the chemistry to change how that material is behaving to do specific things. So the paper does have all the usual caveats you'd expect from the US EPA, but, but really it's a very favorable, you know, kind of assessment of where this, where this field is and where we think it can go. Uh, so just to, just to conclude, I mean, hopefully I've convinced you that, that uh, uh, nanotechnology does have significant potential in this space. I mean, obviously we heard about the potential with, with uh, nanomedicine, but in terms of food production, in terms of sustainably uh, meeting the, the global food security demands that we're gonna have, I really think this, this is uh, uh, an approach that has a lot of potential, um, but you know, it's gotta be safe and sustainable. And the only way you can demonstrate that is if you really understand exactly what your materials are doing. Uh, so obviously, I have a large number of collaborators that, that our group works with. Those are just listed here. These documents over here are the way funding works in the U.S. for nanotechnology is through a program called the NNI, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, which governs how 20 plus federal agencies spend their nanotechnology budgets. Uh, these are the budget requests that come out of the White House and go to Congress. Uh, the 2019 and 2020 versions actually featured some of, some of our work, which was pretty exciting. Uh, but I see I've gone for 30 minutes, so I should probably stop uh, and see if there's a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. White. That was uh, uh, absolutely uh, information-filled um, and uh, fascinating, intriguing. I was trying to take notes and it was very difficult to, for me to keep up with you. So, oh, my name is Lisa, by the way, I'll be uh, chairing the um, uh, questions for you. Thank I you. don't know if you can see me. Do I, just... I cannot. I You're see not... a black oh, screen, okay. but I can hear. Oh, there you are. Oh, where do I look? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor to some questions. Yes. Well, we'll try that again. Uh, I don't, you weren't able to hear that. No, I don't no, think. I didn't okay, hear that. Go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, what kind of uh, limitations do you, are there when it comes to uh, uh, bulk production of these polymers and, and, and use in the industry? Right. So, so there's two, two very important components to that question. One is scale up, just the feasibility of scale up. Uh, and that is something that, that my group and my collaborators always consider um, because, you know, we have some significant problems in terms of food, uh, food insecurity, and we really need to spend time researching uh, approaches that can be scaled up and actually deployed. I'm actually reviewing a paper right now behind me, which is, has wonderful data, but there is no way they can economically scale up. Their, their approach. It's just never going to feasibly work. Um, so we always, from, from you know, the initial discussion of materials, keep in mind the fact that you know, this, is, this is something where we're going to have to produce you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of, of these materials. And if that proves to be too expensive or not feasible, then we shouldn't, shouldn't be working on it. Um, the second part of your question is about industry. Um, and uh, the Agricultural Experiment Station in Connecticut actually is a government agency. So I work for the government. I've often said that if I worked for a major research university, I'd probably be on my third spinoff company. Um, but that's, that's just not something we do here. Um, we do have an ability to patent materials uh, and we do have 
you know, provisional patents on a couple of these things. Uh, I will say that industry is really, really interested in what we're doing. Uh, BASF is funding a postdoc in one of my collaborators' laboratories. Another agrochemical company is, um, you know, just released a call yesterday for hundred thousand dollar proposals that they're just, you know, one page proposals that they could fund. I just had a postdoc leave and go to Corteva. Uh, but when we talk to industry, the first thing that they always say, the thing that's holding them back, is regulatory uncertainty. The US EPA does not really know how to handle these approaches yet in terms of a regulatory framework. And that is making industry very nervous about committing a lot to this. Uh, in, and in Europe, it's even obviously, uh, not surprisingly, they're even a little more cautious than, than, um, than North America is. Uh, but I will say, you know, if you look at the scientific literature and you look at the patents, 75% or more of what you see is out of India and China. These, these approaches are on the street in India and China right now, um, which may or may not be a good idea because I think, you know, I always go back to this, you have to understand the mechanism before you can get excited about your result. Um, but, but this field just in the last four to five years has moved tremendously forward, both in terms of science and in terms of, you know, application. So it, uh, it's a very long winded answer to your question, but I, I think there's a lot of potential here, um, both in terms of, um, you know, interesting science, but also science that's going to make a difference. Oh, no. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so I noticed that you did uh, work with core shell particles and um, targeted release and then controlled release. Have you ever looked into self-immolative polymers such as uh, polyethylglyoxalate where they can degrade in uh, plant conditions and then re release uh, glyoxylic acid? No, that's, I, I've, um, we haven't, we haven't considered that. I mean, uh, I've, I've heard of this, this approach, um, but it's not, it's not one we looked at. And, and, but you brought up a very good point that I should probably mention. A lot of what we are doing on targeted delivery is exactly what nanomedicine has been doing for 10 years. I mean, the, 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 the concept of what we're trying to do is very similar because, you know, most of my work I presented today focused on targeting the plant in the field. But, you know, we also need to target tissues and organs and cells and organelles in the plant. And that's, you know, I've got some collaborators that are working more on that end. Uh, but to answer your specific question, no, we haven't, we haven't thought of that, but that, that's a really interesting approach. Um, I understand that we have two questions from the audience members. Oh, okay, our first question um, from Atik Rahim. Or, or Raman, I'm sorry. Um, how agriculture? Uh, how can agriculture nanotechnology benefit under developing countries in Africa and Asia? Right. So, so actually, the the motto of our institution is putting science to work for society, uh, and a lot of the strategies that we're trying to develop, um, you know. We're, we're, we want to develop strategies that actually can be deployed in different kinds of systems. And we have my actually last trip before COVID was to India, uh, to a group there. Uh, and I've got a trip back scheduled for January. Uh, and in December, there's a group of us going to a conference in Morocco uh, and another back to back conference in Senegal. Um, so I, I think, you know, part of this is we have to we have to develop systems and we that, that are going to work where the problem is going to be felt the worst, the most quickly. I mean, in Connecticut, you know, we have food security issues, but, you know, it, it, it's nothing compared to what you have in some, some other areas of the world. Um, so I think, you know, we need to, we need to keep that in mind and we need to go where the problem is being felt to the greatest extent and we need to have systems that will work there. Uh, and that's, that's part of what we were actually just starting to do. I mean, I, you know, the, before COVID, I was going to China two or three times a year. I've got collaborators in Singapore, and and I mentioned India and Africa, and that all kind of got derailed for two and a half years. But um, you know, we're talking to to companies there, we're talking to collaborators there in, in those types of places, and I, I I think you raise a really really important point. I mean, that's that's where we need to start. Oh, wonderful! Again, that question was from Dr. Ritik Rahman from uh, University of Namibia in Namibia. Okay, okay. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. 
Yes, and I'll bring you the microphone. Yes. Uh, hi. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoy it. And um, is there a way that we can navigate and control ethylene in fruit ripening using nanonutrients? Uh, you broke up a little bit, but you were asking about controlling ethylene production in fruit using nutrients? Nanonutrients, yes, that's correct. Uh, we, we haven't looked at that. Um, we actually, we, we have some field experiments um, with hemp, which is completely unrelated, but the idea is we're trying to control um, the biochemistry of the plant in terms of uh, CBD production and reducing THC production by nutrients. So I, I think what you're proposing is possible. Um, because a lot of what happens with nutrients, obviously, is, is a balance between concentrations and timing. Um, we haven't looked at it, but I, I, do think, I do think there's possibility there. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. White, for this fabulous talk. If we had another half an hour, I, I have a million questions to ask myself. <laughs> um, uh, we do. We are uh, very. It's very uh, upset that you weren't be able weren't able to uh, make it to uh, University of Waterloo, you know. Um, and and we do hope to welcome you uh, very soon in person, uh, so we can continue this talk and um, uh, invite our all of our international guests. Um, my next question is, of course. What is the best way for our audience members to ask you further questions, if they do have? Um, so I can actually make my presentation available. Um, I can send it to Kendra, but um, just just send me an email. I mean, my favorite thing to do is collaborate uh, and build build up our our groups. Um, so my email is is just my name, Jason White at ct .gov. Um, and I can put it in the chat. Although I think my chats only go to the panel, um, but I would say just reach out and uh, you know. We can we can start start a conversation. I'm I'm very disappointed. I I'm not there. I mean, I made it to the airport, but that was it. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful day today too. Nice and sunny. Uh, as I guess it's 28 Celsius. That's about um, 75, 80 Fahrenheit in oh, okay. the sky. <laughs> so it'll we'll put it on hold for you when you actually get to come here. How's that? Sounds good. Thank you, Jason. Uh, if, if everybody can join me in thanking Jason White again.